Oh, they miss my mihi whakatau, but that's the way life is. So um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, the format for this evening is one where uh, we have a series of questions which we've already posed to our panel. Three very clear questions. You will have seen them in the promotional material. We're going to have an opportunity to talk through that for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to open it up to um, those here today. We had over 200 people register on Zoom. I see there's now sitting somewhere around 76 people on Zoom as well. And they'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And knowing educators, I'm sure there'll be the odd comment, some of them quite lengthy, as we, um, as we discuss together. I just wanted to, to briefly begin by talking about what the Aotearoa Educators Collective uh, is. And to stress that it's not aligned to any political party and that the ideals that we're interested in is to, and, and, and the key ideal is to make sure that discussions about schooling is informed by research and is led by academics and school leaders, uh, thought leaders who can inject into the current climate of discussion that level of, of thoughtful care about what the future of education and schooling should be in, um, if we're still allowed to use the, the word Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, and it seems that what we're particularly interested in is the idea that, and I remember when Liam uh, Rutherford and I talked together as part of the curriculum refresh work that we were doing, that that and this this was before the last election, a desire to to take the politics out of education, not to be swinging from one extreme to the other, but to find a way through to a form of consensus which is based on evidence, which is based on the lived experience, which is another form of of research and of evidence of senior leaders, principals, and academics. And I guess the other part of that, kia ora, David, mm -hmm. um, the, the other sense that I have around that is that we, we do live in very politically charged times. And the one of the reasons for creating the collective is to provide a support to those academics and principals who wish to speak out. And those of us who have been long time advocates for progressive ideals know how important it is to have those structures of support. Which draws me, I guess, to one person who I feel the absence of very strongly tonight, and that's my, and uh, also for many of us in this room, our colleague and friend, Professor yeah. Martin Thrupp. And I know Martin, uh, would have been deeply involved in this organisation and would have been yet again fighting for the kind of education that his research showed was possible for children here in Aotearoa. Um, Peter, request from the camera, can you sit? I can so spit, can God. See, we can see your face. Oh, That's even speaking. better. How's that? Is it a good looking face? It is. It's absolutely <laughs> tremendous. Liam said no. No. <laughs> Liam said no. Thank you, Liam. He's a good colleague and friend. Um, you'll see the distinguished panel here. And one of the reasons why you're here is because they are a distinguished panel. So I'm not going to read through the lengthy uh, biographies. I'd rather get the, the evening underway. So the question, every time before the election, I opened up a newspaper or, do we still open up newspapers? Um, uh, when we looked online, there was an assumption and a, almost a growing consensus that New Zealand schooling, New Zealand education system was in crisis. Uh, everyone, it was, it, was, it was a given. And so the response of different political parties to the crisis um, leads off, really, our discussion this evening. So my first question, which will be answered to my left by my colleague and friend here, Rebecca Jessen, um, is 
what is the real crisis in education? Um, I'm going to answer the question by, um, so I was asked to come onto this and talk about evidence. So I got wads of evidence. So I, just, I because I have been thinking, have we got a crisis? And do we need a crisis? Um, and what is a crisis intended to create? Um, so I wanted to start with PISA. So I'm, I'm the PISA person. Um, because PISA is the um, the headline that comes around every year. We are having a crisis. The PISA results are out. Um, New Zealand is in crisis. And on the on PISA day, I googled PISA literacy crisis, and there were headlines in New Zealand, Australia, the um, the UK, America, Canada. But not Ireland, who were quite happy with their status in PISA. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking, okay, what is the crisis? So when I go and look at the PISA results, so PISA is the OECD test, um, and New Zealand ranks in PISA in the same band, not significantly different from uh, United States, Ontario, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Australia. Significantly better than United Kingdom, Poland, Denmark, Finland. Um, Czech Republic, Sweden, Switzerland, Italy, Austria, Germany, Belgium, Portugal, Norway, and the OCD average, and significantly worse than, just um, lower than, I should say, uh, Canada, Macau, Estonia, Chinese Taipei, Korea, Japan, Ireland, and at the top, Singapore. Now, that might not be the story that you have heard in the media, but our, our Aotearoa performance on PISA at 15 year olds is very similar to the US, Australia. Singapore rates on top. And we have been dropping and we have dropped in insignificant amounts each year, except for the years between um, 2009 and 2012, when we had a significant drop in PISA in the literacy results. And if you think about what uh, success in PISA looks like, it is this high proficiency in PISA is students who reach high proficiency are able to solve intertextual conflicts. They are reading across more than one text. They are making inferences about their source of information and they have high level critical thinking about multiple lengthy texts. So that's it. that is the definition of a high achieving literacy 15 year old. So, but the, the crisis that we are being told is that um, it's about what we didn't teach them when they were five. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, we need to investigate that as the, um, the, the, the hypothesis. So I'm thinking, I work at a university, I've got scientific method. I was going to say up the yin yang, but it's not real. It's not very academic. No, very academic. <laughs> I've got scientific method in my training. We need to run a null hypothesis. So in the scientific method, when you would run a hypothesis, you would run a null hypothesis, which is what would it look like if this wasn't true? So the null hypothesis for the reason we're diving in PISA, so forth, would be that if, if the thesis is that it's because we didn't teach them the basics when they were five, then we would see that show up, presumably in PEARLS, which is the year five test. So I've got to look at the year five test to run the null hypothesis. Um, we haven't been falling back in the year five test. Our average in the year five test at its pearls is 521. It's remained relatively stable. There was a dip a la, similar to PISA between 2010 and 2015, but it's remained relatively stable since 2001. I'm gonna pass over but I have been, because I think my next bits are, are about answering the, the next couple of questions. But my point here is when we're talking about being scientific, we're not talking about cherry picking the, our favorite confirmations. We are talking about reading, interrogating the claims, 
not repeating the claims. To me, that is the scientific method. So I've got more interrogations when you're going to ask me what is the real crisis at the minute, because it's an opportunity I'm going to need to pass on. But I think we could look underneath. The scientific method would ask, what are the causal mechanisms? What's underneath these? You wouldn't say, Here's a, here is a um, problem that I see, so here is your solution. That's called advertising. <laughs> when you're doing the scientific method, you are running the causal mechanisms and you are figuring out what sits below those um, headlines. So what would be the explanations for what we're seeing? And I've got a few theories about those explanations, but I think Linda might have some too. Thank you. Pass on to Linda, who, um, if you've never been out to May Road School, you should. It's a great school. And I always think a lot of that is down to great principles, and Linda is certainly one of those. Thank you, Peter. Uh, kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui kia koutou, ko Linda Stewart Topongua, ko Maiaki on May Road School. So I'm Linda and I'm the principal of May Road School. And um, I feel quite privileged to be on this panel. Um, I, I guess mine is the lived experience. Yes, I've got um, academia in my background, but I see the crisis every single day. The crisis that I see in, in our school, and I don't really call it a crisis, um, but what I see in our school is huge inequity. And the inequity has been growing over many, 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 many years. We're in a country where education, our education system is treated as a political football. And I think Peter alluded to that before where we have a change of government, and so we have a change of direction in education. And what happens is our educators get caught in all of that. The policies change, and what we, what we have to do is to fight really hard in some situations for those things that we know make the difference for children. Now, what I'm seeing at the moment is an exponential increase in the number of children coming into our school with exceedingly high needs, high health needs. I, I haven't seen for many, many years, I haven't seen children coming into school um, who need toilet training. When I talk to my principal colleagues, that's exactly what they're seeing. High numbers of children with health needs, who need toilet training, who may need speech language therapy, psychologists, um, occupational therapists, who have anxiety or trauma. Some of this reflects the society that we're in at the moment. Some of it is the result of the past years that we've been in, where we've had children who have not had preschool because they were in their houses because of COVID. There are many, many, many reasons for this, but the complexity is there. What don't we have? We don't have the resourcing that we need to meet the needs of those children. That's the crisis that I see every day. Our children rock up to school, and I hate the term, ready for school. Because actually, schools do an amazing job of trying to reach out for where the children are at. That's, that's what we pride ourselves on in the New Zealand education system. However, how the heck do our teachers, our learning assistants, those who work closest to our, to our children, actually make the difference that they get out of bed every day to make for those kids, if they don't have the resourcing around them to do it. And that's the stuff that we see. So the political football, we need to actually have a strong vision for education in this country that is bipartisan, that actually means that our educators, our academics, our thought leaders in education can actually work together to do what we know is important and will make the difference for our children. Children, we pass on to Jody, who's travelled up from the White Cuttle. No. no, you didn't come up from Massachusetts. Of course, over the shore, even worse. Far harder to come from the shore than it is to come from further south. Sure, Jody. Kia ora, Kia ora Anna. Um, so, Jody Hunter at Massey University. And um, 
I guess what I'd like to take is from the perspective of mathematics education, that's the field that I work in, and in specific education. And I'd really build a lot on what Linda said, which is comes down to me, the crisis is both a lack of direction and a lack of resourcing across our schooling systems. So if I took professional learning and development as an example of the lack of resourcing and direction, we've had set up a system in this country now where professional learning and development for teachers, which is much needed to continue being lifelong learners and to grow our teacher capacity in an ongoing way, is set up in a competitive way. So all of schools in New Zealand do not have access to professional learning and development. Instead, they have to compete with each other to get access to professional learning and development. So that's a real big concern. If you look at countries which are high performing, like Singapore, quite often people like to take um, kind of what I call a little bit of the easy view and say, oh, it's about the curriculum or it's because they use textbooks. But in fact, my colleagues from Singapore will openly say one of the reasons that they've got a highly skilled teaching force is because every teacher there has 100 hours of professional development each year. So that's how we grow people. So instead of the kind of blame game, which I see happening a lot, which also links to the PISA results and TIMS, and then we need to turn it around and stop talking about the crisis with the teacher, but you know, teaching crisis or that kind of crisis and instead think, what do we want to do to develop an equitable education system that is built on research? And if we want that, what we need to do is invest in our teachers, invest in educational research, and actually develop our own plan for how we have a world-class education system. We have a lot of good things happening in many schools. But one thing I do say, when I look at PISA and when I look at TIMS, the thing that I look at as a Pacific person, Cook Island descent, is not how well we're doing compared to Singapore or to Australia or America, but instead I look and think, how well are we serving the learners in our schools? And are we serving all of our learners in the same way? And I do think when we look at those, as much as... Um, you know, we can argue about the tests and the questions and the formats. We can say one clear message we get from Tim's and we get from PISA is that there are groups of learners in our school and system who we are not doing a good job serving. And that will be Pacifica students and Māori students. So I think we need to think very clearly about what can we do better in terms of leadership from the Ministry of Education, um, as well as educators and teachers to think how do we serve all children well. And I'll just give you, just to finish, I'll give you a little example. Um, I go back to the crisis in education and the kind of framing of this, which, you know, one solution's been given as we need to teach maths an hour a day, which was really, um, it's a little bit embarrassing to say because I feel slightly responsible for this because that was cherry-picked from the Royal Society report on mathematics teaching, which I was part of writing. And it certainly wasn't a recommendation that was meant to be taken alone. So it was a recommendation along with 12 other recommendations of resourcing and teaching mathematics and what's going to make a difference in a holistic way. So we can't just take that one simplistic part out of it and you know go forward with that. But when I think about mathematics teaching and what we need to do differently, we need to stop thinking it is just about results on TIMS and results and tests. And we need to think about mathematics in a holistic way. So we need to think about the well-being of children in mathematics classrooms. We need to think about children maintaining their cultural identity in the mathematics classroom. Um, we need to think about, of course, we need to think about the cognitive aspects as well. You know, how are children learning? What access do they have to mathematics? But from my own work, the crisis, I think, is when we've interviewed children in the schools um, at the beginning of work that we've done for research and PLD, we ask the children, how do you feel being whatever ethnicity they self-identify with in the mathematics classroom? And in schools with a large number of Pacific students that we've done this work, around about a third of the children say things like, it's weird being Tokelauan in the maths classroom because Tokelauans don't do maths. Or I'm Samoan and I have to become a Palangi to do maths. And when it gets hard and I can't do it anymore, I'll go back to being Samoan. 
So that to me is the real crisis in our education system. How do we instead have children who are confident and secure and happy in their cultural identity and achieving in our school system? Children, Jodie, I think Rebecca's going to leap in. Oh, yes, because I want to talk about exactly what you're saying here in terms of digging underneath those, those numbers and thinking about who and under what circumstances sit under, no, under those numbers. So my second point about being scientific in your thinking is thinking about the whole distribution, not just the dot of the average in the middle. So we need to think about the whole distribution of our country's um, achievement. So I'm still digging into pearls and pizza, and I am going to try to call you, Jodie, because I'm thinking about, you know, our average in pearls year five literacy achievement was 521. Um, but the impact of uh, having been at more than one school. So if you've only been at this school, you get uh, you, the average is 532. If you've only been to two schools, the average is 522. If you've been to three schools, the average is 511. Pearl's international um, average is 500. So if you've been to three schools, you're still operating above Pearl's international 500. But if you've been to more than three primary schools, on average, children's score is 478. Mm. So it's who is this a crisis for? Um, our year five students being absent from school, never or almost never, 535, once or twice a month, once a month or every two months, sorry, 542. Away once a fortnight, 504, still above um, Pisa, a Pearl's average, sorry. Away once a week, 446. So again, who is in a crisis for? Um, the effect on SES on our children's outcomes. The average effect of, of SES on our children's outcomes, the estimated difference between affluent and disadvantaged students in Pearls Year 5 in New Zealand is 70 points. Greater than New Zealand is Iran on 76, Malta on 79, Brazil on 85, and Bulgaria on 88. Um, so our children and less, less vulnerability shown in the Australian system 54, the international average of 43, England, England's average of 39. So our children are more vulnerable to the effects of SES than anybody in any of those countries but Iran, Malta, Brazil, and Bulgaria. Something about our system is making our children vulnerable to the effects of SES on their education. Um, student bullying scale. If you're almost never bullied, 542. About monthly, 530. About weekly, 468. Dipping below that 500. I think if we've got a crisis, it's not a, it's not a uniform crisis. It's a crisis for some people in some conditions in our system. And I think I've got more. I've got numbers and numbers and numbers. When you look at who is being affected by this literacy crisis, it is not playing out equally in our society. Thank you, Rebecca, and the rest of the panel. I think a more nuanced reading and a more sophisticated, researched lens into the data moves away from the simple politics that says our kids can't read, our kids can't write, they can't do number, but actually beginning to dig in and to truly understand what is happening in our schools. And for that to be led by researchers and by principals and thought leaders, rather than politicians who might want on either end of the political spectrum, to take advantage of simplistic readings of quite sophisticated data can lead to all sorts of um, simple solutions. So it leads, I think, and I'm hoping, um, Rebecca, maybe you know, your rich analysis of this data might become available, not just in academic papers, but also available um, on, on the AEC website. Um, but what are, rather than the simple slogans, to fix what's seen as a very simple crisis, what, what would make 
some of the difference. And I'm going to ask um, Jody to start at the other end of the panel. Yeah, so I think when I think about what would make the difference, definitely I think if we had better resourcing um, across our schooling and education system, that would make a huge difference for both our learners and educators as well. But I also take it back to being guided by research and an evidence base. So I think we can look at things like our, the curriculum and the curriculum design. Um, and if I take it looking at a mathematics lens, uh, I think there's quite a lot of agreement across maths education researchers that for mathematics to be taught in a way where children are having access to the mathematical ideas that are needed to develop strong mathematical understanding. And by that, I'll define it as both procedural fluency. So that's, you know, the capability to uh, know your basic facts, to put them into action, to solve number problems and things like that, but also conceptual understanding, which is really the important um, aspect as well, which is being able to justify, being able to reason mathematically, being able to solve problems. So we need an education system which is going to address both of those areas of mathematics. And one of the kind of, one of my concerns, I think, is that we've had this kind of dichotomy that you're either doing a back-to-basics approach, which is all about procedures, or you're doing conceptual understanding, which is, you know, potentially uh, not so kind of structured. Um, I think that for teachers and for educators to, to be able to teach mathematics, which is addressing both of these, we do really have to have better resourcing in terms of supporting teachers on what to teach. So I know that the Ministry of Education had uh, has undertaken some work looking at what can high-performing systems do around the world. And one of the things that was clear is that the high-performing systems give teachers not an assessment on what children should be able to do, but on what teachers are given guidance on what concepts should be taught on a year-to-year -year basis. So it's a different way of thinking about our curriculum. It's not thinking about our curriculum and testing children to make sure that they know this concept or this concept before you teach them, you know, another concept. But instead, supporting teachers to know that it's helpful for children to know this at year one and have access to these ideas at year one and then these ideas at year two. So we've actually got a coherent structure to our curriculum. And that's a research-based, research-formed way of working. The second part that I would say there is I think that we need to have far more access to professional learning and development that is acceptable long-term and researched. So at the moment, the system we've had is basically professional learning and development providers, quite often um, either individuals or companies, who are undertaking professional learning and development in schools but we've had a lack of research to see what are the outcomes of that. You know, what is the what are the outcomes? What is happening? Um, it's been left up to people themselves to do that work rather than having funding and having a deliberate approach to assessing and thinking about what the outcomes are. And my concerns with this are that then we keep swinging one way to another because we're not following a research informed or research led approach to our education system. So those are just a couple of ideas from, from myself about how could we change. But I think the big part is the resourcing too. So um, I think about in mathematics, the resources that are needed for teachers, examples of tasks, for example. You know, it's really been a bit of a scattershot approach to kind of task development and things like that. And, and, and that kind of gap which has been left by a lack of direction. We've then had a lot of... Uh, International companies stepping in and saying, here's, here's a ready-made curriculum that's been made for somewhere else, and that's the solution. And I don't think we need to go to that kind of a source for a solution. I think we need to have a solution that fits with our Pacific community, our Māori community, you know, the diverse strands of, of children and families that make up our country, not wholesalely importing something from overseas. So following on from, from Jody and from um, Rebecca, I guess uh, ours is the lived experience again. And we work alongside uh, the program that Jody is, has um, developed and researched. Um, what I see, so we, we work with the DIMIC program, 
developing mathematical communities of inquiry. Um, what do I see in our school? I see children who absolutely love maths because the maths is grounded in their reality. It's based around their language, their culture and identity. We have a large Pacifica population in the school, a growing Māori population in the school, and actually with the housing development that's happening around us, it's basically the United Nations that we see in. This works for all. The interesting thing around this is that many of the elements of it, you can take through to any element, any curriculum area. So we, we transfer it through to our reading and our writing because it's grounded in the children's lived experiences. Any of the, the problem solving that they do is around a problem that they understand and they know. So we don't have the child, hopefully, saying, actually, I need to be palangi in the classroom when I do maths. Because actually, the problems, the conversations, the discourse is around concepts that they are highly familiar with. So what do they learn to do? They learn that critical thinking that we were talking about is needed for our 15-year-olds. They learn to challenge ideas, not the person, but the idea. They learn to revoice. They learn to explain. They work collaboratively. They problem solve. They learn things like resilience. There are all sorts of, of wonderful um, things that are learnt through a maths lesson that then goes into the other lessons that they have or the other curriculum areas that they have. And what is this underpinned by? Language, culture and identity. What is it also about? It's about relationships. And I think we haven't um, really talked a lot about that here. But what we know is where we develop strong relationships with children in, in our schools, it actually makes, and their families, their ayana, their bano, it actually makes a huge difference. Um, Rebecca talked about the number of schools that children go to. And because we're in the midst of a housing development, we see that on a daily basis. So we know that when those kids come into our school, we have to reach out straight away. We don't have any time to wait. One of the things that we talk about is you only get the 27th of March, 2024 once. So that's the chance that we have with our children. We're really aware of that, developing the relationships, basing our, our teaching and learning environment under language, culture and identity with, and I have to agree totally with Jody around what she said about PLD. PLD should not be a lottery in this country. We all know that when we started as teachers, we were just beginning on, on a journey of crafting our craft. And we should be enabled to craft our craft. It shouldn't be that when our school um, happens to be successful and get 40 hours or whatever it was in the last round, that that's what it looks like and other schools miss out or somebody else gets 200 hours. Actually, I love the idea that every single teacher has an, has an amount of hours that they can have over their year to craft their club because that's the way we're going to get teachers who have the strategies to meet the needs of their children, whatever it looks like. And I think that's that's the sort of thing that we need to be taking in from here on. Um, and I know we're going to talk about it a little bit more. I think where you underpin your teaching and learning environments with those concepts that I've talked about, our children can make huge progress. And, and we've got research that shows that. So that's probably it from me. <laughs> Would I add, I total um, what Jody said a lot about not 
not thinking of things in binaries, but thinking across. There's a lot of space between, you know, this side and that side. There's a lot of space that you can do both and. Um, so I would be um, supporting both of my colleagues here and in, in focusing on teacher expertise and quality decision making and enabling teachers to do that um, quality decision making in both planned and responsive ways. So we plan the um, quality and then we respond in the moment. So you, that it's not either planned or responsive. There is places in the middle where you can be both planned and responsive. Well, that's my argument anyway. I would, um, I would argue for high expectations, which is why I read out the definition of the PISA outcomes, because I think that if we are focusing on achieving minimum standards, then we will achieve minimum. We won't have our eyes on, on those higher outcomes. And we will expect those higher outcomes from all of our children. Uh, and to do that, we need an understanding of what sits between a policy announcement and the experience a child has in, the, at, in their schooling. And all of those sources of variability that sit in between there, there is no straight line from the curriculum to the experience the child gets in the classroom. There is instructional science, there is implementation science, there is cognitive science, there is behavioral science, but there's also this notion of motivation, another edge of the educational sciences. There's a notion of social learning. Um, there's the notion of dialogic teaching. These ways that children learn from the people that they are with are relational processes. So there's a lot of things that go on from policy announcement to implementation. And my, my work has always been in the implementation part of, of what we're trying to do. We're trying to do a very good job of following a particular policy. So how do we make ourselves be really good at the job that we've got? And for me, that's a teacher decision-making school, um, school decision-making space where people are trying to do the best they can for the learners who, who they, and it's that space in between between the policy and the child. That's where the teacher works. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to the panel. I know there's a lot of um, verbiage coming out of Wellington around the science of learning yes. at the moment. And I think reminding ourselves that there are a number of sciences which inform what happens in classrooms and to unpack the learning experience provides yet again a more nuanced uh, research informed lens into what it is that we do. Um, my my next question um, brings in our ninety participants who are online. Uh, lovely to, I'd say, see you, but lovely to have you as part of us here this evening. And I know you're from all over the Motu, so um, it's great to have you here. This question, um, I think, might. Um, address the one that was on the the, the, the the advertisement for tonight, but shifts it in some other way as well. And to remind um, those online, if you wish to submit a, a question that's been moderated at the moment, um, and um, I'm receiving those in. So um, wrap your chops around this one. That's a very academic entry into a discussion. As educators who are informed by research, how is it that we have a government that refuses to ask the sector for their involvement in decision making? So what can we do to ensure we make it clear to this government or any governments perhaps, you know that's this government, that demanding we teach an hour of reading, writing and maths per day when we know that our students cannot and should not be expected to be subjected to that? I teach in a predominantly Māori community, and there is no way that our tamariki can sit still to read a book, but they will recite their whakapapa, and so are very oral learners. Give them a waiata, and they will have the words down pat in no time. If I go back to National Standards days, well, there's a thought. Okay. Uh, we've got academics and teachers and forums to develop plans against the germ. Remember we used to call it the germ, the global education reform movement. I think it's still there. What initiatives do you have in mind? And I'll just pass um, that more pointed critique of what's happening across to the panel. Uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm not going to answer the question on the initiatives just yet because I need to think about that a bit more. But I am going to um, reflect on national standards because it was it did come up for me in the alert with the PISA results and the, the decline after 2010. And what we did do there is decide that literacy was a thing that was different from learning um, and was different from the curriculum areas. And I think that to have picked up literacy and taken it out of the curriculum as if it was something different from learning about stuff, reading and writing about stuff and being really interested in the stuff you're learning about through reading and writing and singing and, and all of those other literacy ways that we access learning, um, I think created a bit of an issue for us and, and conceptually in the curriculum. Um, so that doesn't answer your question about initiative to get the government to listen to me. I haven't figured that one out yet. No. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, I think what we're doing as a profession is, is um, holding on to, I think whatever we decide to do, we hold on to teacher professionalism and teacher decision making. Um, we do it in the, for the benefit of our children, their fun and their communities uh, because if we are going to follow uh, scripts written by people from our other countries that have been sort of New Zealandified, we are doing our children a disservice. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think that um, you know when the when the policy came out and the questions have been asked. I've been run as a principal to um, ask about my policy around the hour of reading, writing and um, maths and also the um, the banning of cell phones. That's fine. I don't have a problem. It's in the policy. And actually, over our day, our children will be given an hour of reading, an hour of writing and an hour of maths. Um, it may not look like a child sitting with a book for an hour because I totally agree with our person who has... Um, who has asked that question, actually that's not appropriate. For our five-year-olds, what are they going to be doing for their hour of, of literacy? I tell you what, over the day they are reading, they are writing, they are exploring what language is, they have many, many, many different ways that they explore mathematics. There will be some that is done in, in within their within their groups. There is some that will be done individually. There are some that will be done as a whole class. There are so many different ways. So I have no problem around saying that at May Road School, that is what happens for our children. And I find it really interesting that suddenly it becomes a conversation piece. It's one of those little sound bites, I think that actually takes us away from the real issues that we talked about right at the very, very, very beginning. And that that really concerns me. Yeah, I don't have too much to add, apart from saying that I think if we want to be heard, we have to work as a collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, and I was really excited to see this set up because I think um, in the media, and um, in this kind of general view, education's kind of been picked apart and people pitted against each other, schools pitted against each other, school leaders. Um, and I think we need to have a collective voice to be heard. And we've been talking a bit, I've been talking to some of our colleagues in mathematics education research about that because I've had conversations before the election with colleagues in uh, the Ministry of Education, but other maths education researchers as well. And we had an amazing piece of work that was undertaken in, I think, 2008, which was the best evidence synthesis in mathematics, which my colleagues Linda Anthony and Margaret Walshaw wrote, which was basically taking, synthesizing all of the research from around the world to say, what is the best evidence that we have about the ways that mathematics is taught? And my colleagues across mathematics education research all agree that that's a seminal piece of work that shouldn't have just been shelved, which is basically what happened to it. And I think there's agreement across us as maths education researchers, as a collective, that we need to think about what was in that. We can update it to now, but actually those are the kind of key principles of high functioning mathematics education, which were in that best evidence synthesis. Um, but what we've talked about is 
because the ministry has said to me on occasion that there's a lot of disagreement about the best way to teach mathematics. And my response to that has been not across maths education researchers, people who are working in schools and working in our universities and education, we don't have a lot of disagreement. We all know the kind of high leverage practices that we need to be putting into practice. So the disagreement I think comes across from others who might not necessarily have maths education research, working in other disciplines who are commenting on mathematics. Um, and somehow I think there's been more of a collective in that sense than us as maths education researchers, if that makes sense. You know, so there's kind of been a grouping together, I feel, um, that we haven't achieved ourselves. So we've got to think about how do we develop a collective voice because there's much more power in that than me just saying my perspective is this. Yeah. Just one more question from online and then we'll open it up to um, you here in the room. And this question is, and I think I'll have a first crack at it because <laughs> it's one that I quite like. What would you say to politicians who want more and more structured teaching, aka syllabus in state schools, but let charter schools do what they want in terms of curriculum and non-qualified teachers. And I guess I would admit to my confusion that the government doesn't trust the professional in state schools, doesn't trust um, principals to manage their schools. And so there's all sorts of strictures around um, not only what we teach, but it won't be long before we're also told exactly how to teach and when to teach. And I'm confused that we have about to begin again an alternative structure mm -hmm. who are trusted to get on with the business um, and how that sits alongside each other is somewhat confusing for me. So if I had the opportunity to ask a question about that, it would be to clear to clarify how you can have that inside one government as they as they move towards that. And I would suggest to you that this collective will be somewhat engaged in research informed discussion as those bills come to the House to re-establish um, charter schools. I'm sure that will be part of our remit. Did anyone else want to speak about that? I'm just all saying I I totally agree with everything that you've just said there, Peter. I think it's also the distraction that then goes into the media, the um, conversation with our colleagues. It's the distraction that I worry about. Instead of actually us really focusing in on the real issues that we have in order to meet the needs of the children that we have in our schools, we get distracted into the space where, yeah, I find it a little confusing too. And I don't want to be confused about stuff like that. I want to get on and be the best principal that I can be alongside the best teaching staff that I have to make the best difference for those children that I work with. And that's the important stuff. And I, I, I just find it, um, yeah, a bit confusing too, Peter. Mm. Lovely. We're going to open the, the floor for discussion. But before we do that, what we thought we might do, um, the research says that you can only sit so long before your brain synapses um, start to close over. So I'm just going to give people the opportunity after a good 45 minutes to stand and have a stretch for 20 seconds. At home, this is your moment where you can quickly head to the loo or to the kitchen, or remove children from the space, or whatever it is that you think you need to do, just for a minute or two.
I hope you're all getting quiet up. Yes, I do. I I I there is a wonderful collection of um, people from literally all over the Mortu, principals, teachers, um, officials from the Ministry of Education having to listen in, uh, oh, which is always oh. interesting and exciting. A few names I recognise. Um, so um, this is an opportunity to share our, our knowledge and our thinking about things. Stephen, if you have met, a member of the AEC management group, also a, a, a distinguished principal, you will is people. passing around uh, the mic. Okay, I've got something to say. Uh, I'm, my name's Joe Cogle, and I'm retired. And I'm having a wonderful time being retired because <laughs> I've been to my first NZEI paid union meeting in three decades. And I had a wonderful time because nothing has changed since I came out of teaching and doing nothing. It's just got worse. <laughs> you know, I learned as a young teacher that the class I worked in in Lower Hutt. I was in a working class community, mainly new immigrants, and they all worked their butt off. And some children didn't come to school, and the public health nurse would go there, and she would have been probably in her 50s at that stage, and she'd say there, well, that's a dress I went there when the grandfather wasn't coming to school. You know, those kind of things. So there were families of generations. I knew that children who came and went during the year was always the same group. I would probably have only had a, a, a long-term group of students was a third of my class that were there the whole year. The other two thirds was moving fast. And just as you started to make headway, you know, finally get the child working and moving on, they'd gone again. Now, that problem in the early 70s is multiplied now because we have unrelenting poverty, we have a housing crisis, and families are moving again and again and again. The great and famous edict of an hour's reading, writing, and maths is nonsense. We did that without having to be told that. But my belief is, and I could be horribly wrong, but the directive has come from people who are in privileged positions, went to school way back, had class, were in classrooms where there was not a lot of coming and going. The classroom was probably predominantly um, uh, European, and there might have been the odd brown face or a non-English speaking child. The reality in every single classroom in this country now, and certainly north of Taupo, 
is that every class has got a United Nations in there and you have to deal with it. And every single politician that's making all those statements are only there because a primary teacher taught them how to read, write, and do maths. <laughs> and they haven't, they've forgotten that. But they will remember their classes as they sat in rows, maybe in groups, and they all did the same thing at the same time. Yeah, and the words, the world today in classrooms is completely different. And it is nonsense what they are saying. It is nonsense that they can direct or have little pots and pans of uh, charter schools versus state schools. My answer is very simple. If, if a charter school is going to get 48,000 per child, I think was one of the figures I read. 61. 69. 69. Well, 69,000 per child, and a state school is getting less than 10. Well, you know, how many primary schools have we got in the country? How many secondary schools? We all go in to become a charter school because you immediately get the funding that you should be getting now. <laughs> and you can't get that funding because you're not resourced and you're going crazy. And then you're told that we're failing. You are not failing. You are not resourced. The fact that you're not not failing and you're turning up every day is a miracle every day. If every teacher took sick leave because they needed to, this country's classrooms would close week after week after week. Joe, I'm going to jump in right there and thank and you for your I comments. <laughs> that, oh, I think you said a great deal. And look at this, the amount of support that you have here. I'm not going to pass it over to the, the panel, but I can see my good friend Liz. No, you're not taking it to Liz. Where we going? Yeah. Liz Horgan probably Sorry. agrees with every word you said, Joe. <laughs> um, I was really interested in all of your points. I think it's like you've got some significant issues, but not unknown issues. Um, Rebecca, I was interested in your interrogation of the teaser about the most uh, question I had for you is was there any connection or correlation between the system leadership of different education systems across the board, you know, who either did teaser? And the New Zealand system, given that they're a highly evolved system, because in all the things that you've identified, such as lack of direction, lack of understanding the form of professional learning, lack of understanding of the important concepts, it seems to me that we've got a system leadership issue. So that's one question. And the second one, which is perhaps even a bigger one, you identify the the impact of socioeconomic status on children, particularly our most vulnerable children, who tend to be predominantly Maori and Pacifica, because they're highly represented in poverty stats. How does an education system address that? And just to go back to recall Martin Trump, remember attending his first professorial address, and his Martin's huge loss of education in New Zealand. And one of the things that really stuck in my mind when I said was that. Um, if a government was really serious about addressing educational issues in New Zealand, they would, I can't remember whether it was triple or quadruple, but it was a very large amount, um, would quadruple the amount of funding that went into low ESOP to low ESOP at the time. So there's kind of two issues here about system leadership and about um, how we address those um, stages that an impact has on kids living on the communities. Thanks, that, that's a big question, Liz, in terms of policy borrowing and, and which parts of policy people cherry pick to borrow. Um, it is you are pointing to uh, a solution that needs to look at sociological as well as educational thinking, and, and which would Martin is a sociologist of education, because we are looking at the relationship between um how a society reproduces its privilege and whether or not the children of, of that society get access into that privilege. Mm -hmm. um, so now I might even be launching into political theory and political economy. But in the sense um, of reproducing privilege and putting the system um, to the market forces and, and allowing a system of haves and have-nots 
is um, a level above what a curriculum decision is at a, is at a system resourcing decision, isn't it? And, um, and how we, like you say, have devolved in a way that has meant that our children become very, very vulnerable to those market forces and those economic forces that are driving the quality of education that they're being able to receive. I think um, in terms of having a look at systems and system resilience to poverty, then we need to look beyond just uh, curriculum, but we actually need to look at how systems are set up. Yeah, I agree with you there. No, thank you. You know, and to, and to remind the you of the non-political party um, affiliation that AEC has, you know, the, the Labour government missed the opportunity to reform tomorrow's schools. Yeah. And it was an extraordinarily bad decision, you know, fed by research informed research, research that they clearly said that we had a system that punished um the poor mm -hmm. that rewarded rich schools that did all that and the opportunity to really make that difference and to wind back tomorrow's schools was something that was lost in the previous government and I know there were people in this room and, and across um, the sector who recognised that lost opportunity and until we actually move perhaps away from simple fixes in classrooms to understanding that this is actually a systemic issue and that we need to look more widely, and that's something neither Labour nor nor National has been willing to change or challenge since 1989. Um, Stephen, do you have? Hi, um, I'm Melanie Dorian, and um, I have a really like what Rebecca had to say about the pearls. That would be really, be released like a document. Mm -hmm about that so that we could share that around because that would be really good. And my question is about the ministerial advisory group that was in this weekend this yes. year. And I know that some of these people are your colleagues, but how concerning uh, is the membership of that advisory group to us? Because it's very concerning to me. I would say from a maths education research perspective, the fact that we've got a group that only has one person who's a maths education researcher in that role is very concerning. Because I think that um, I would be loath myself to tell a pure mathematician how to do pure mathematics at a university level. So I'm not quite sure how pure mathematicians can tell me as a primary, first and foremost primary school teacher, who taught new entrants in year ones and year twos and year fives and sixes in my teaching career. Um, I'm not quite sure, coming from that perspective, what a pure mathematician, what advice a pure mathematician could give me teaching five year olds. So, yes, I'm quite concerned by that. Yeah, and I also think that um, process-wise, it was a very concerning process. I talked from this from being um, on the mathematics refresh, correct to the writing team, and on the common practice model writing team as well. And for both of those uh, appointments as such, there was a clear process where you applied to be on those, where you were nominated by different organisations, where there was a, a kind of in-depth process to make sure that they were compiled of people with expertise in different areas of mathematics education. Whereas this ministerial advisory group, um, I'm not sure what the process was used to select people on it because nothing, there was no calls, no asking for expressions of interest, nothing. It was just announced, this is the group. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so for me as a maths educator, I'm pretty concerned because, yeah, I, I don't think that our job at primary school is, is um, I've had a conversation with a mathematician who said, oh, but wouldn't you want us mathematicians to be telling you what needs to be taught at school to prepare children for university? Um, 
I don't really think that's actually the right order of things and such. And um, yeah, I, I think that we're disregarding the expertise that we have. Uh, just, just further to that, the comment from many of my colleagues was uh, very similar. It was around the speed of the process of pulling together a group of people and, and the lack of process a, a, a about it as well. It was also real concern at the six, seven years of work that's actually happened over the last little while that people have, you know, spent blood, sweat and tears over that is actually dismissed almost. And Jodie's just talked about the work that she's done. Well, she's not the only one. And actually we've had literacy, mathematics experts working on the common practice model, on the curriculum. It's a little bit like the, um, the workforce strategy group that we had when I, when I was doing another piece of work that I was involved in and they did all this work and it ends up with nothing. You know, people, you've had experts, you've had people giving their opinion, working through their research, offering their solutions to the crisis and we just wiped that to one side and we started all again and then we dictate something. There's something wrong with that and so we're concerned out there in the sector around what will this deliver? What will it look like? Will it really take account of the realities that we're seeing on a on a day-to-day -day basis? Will it really make the difference for our children? I think that's where we're at. Can I just say one other thing? Sure. Yeah, and I guess building on what Linda said, um, the, the kind of putting it on hold too, for me in, in mathematics education, there's a sense of urgency in terms of the curriculum mm. because I think that we can say that the previous curriculum didn't necessarily achieve what we wanted it to achieve. Um, there's been a lot of confusion. I mean, a number of factors. I'm not just saying it's curriculum. So um, it was combined curriculum, then the introduction of national standards and then kind of a lack of understanding of what the curriculum had within it and all of those kinds of things. So to me, you know, there is some kind of urgency and we did, like Linda said, in the maths curriculum refresh, you know, worked on that nearly two years, um, looking at other curriculums around the world, looking at the research about how children learn concepts and, and you know, what you would expect children at five and at six and at seven to, to kind of the building blocks, I suppose. Yeah. And for that now just to be put on hold and, the, and kind of a big vacuum of what's going to happen is concerning. Um, my concerns are a bit different. My, I would, I am concerned for Tāna Tatariti, Ponte Tariti or Waitangi and representation within the groups. Um, and I'm also concerned about vested interests and conflicts of interests. Well, I think it's been quite some time. I know in an interview that the Minister of Education did before the election with Sean Plunkett, she made it um, really clear to um, that distinguished journalist that um, she did not trust the Ministry of Education. She did not trust their advice. She did not trust the experts who were working. And she made it really clear that she was going to establish her own group of experts who would provide the advice and support that she wanted. And she did that very quickly, I would imagine, um, alongside a group that had already um, being selected even before the election. Stephen, passing on to Paul. Um, I have the privilege of being the uh, leader of teacher education here at um, Waihata Pumakaro. And um, I have an observation um, followed by an advertisement, followed by a question. <laughs> Um, so the, the observation is um, the, the, the discussion around the national standards um, kind of sent a shiver up my spine. I remember those days. Um, many of you in the room, on the you can see you over there, will um, know uh, Louis Guy, um, a great mentor of mine, and he uh, made the courageous stand to, uh, to step down from his principal role because he wasn't going to ask the staff to put in place national standards. And I just remember that being a very critical stance but a very sad day for education. 
Um, my youngest son uh, started school when the year national standards started and exited uh, his uh, his primary school in the year it finished. And that year, he, uh, well, he, he, um, he wrote me a birthday card and it said, Dear Dad, uh, I hope you have a well above standard. <laughs> <laughs> And then, what has happened to me? So that, that's my uh, that's my observation. My um my advertisement is I'm also here uh, as a I'm a member of the Teacher Education Forum of New Zealand, along with my colleague Eunice from um, AUT who is here. Um, and on the convener of this year's uh, conference, which is going to be held here in Auckland. Um, and if you've got your diaries handy, it's going to be on the 11th, uh, the evening of the 11th of July and the day of the 12th of July, Thursday, Friday. Um, and we are, the theme is really around the threats to the challenges that are coming teacher education's way with the current government. And the title is Educating the Professional or Training the Worker. Keeping sight of teacher education in times of change. Um, so the, the abstract talks about there's an acceptance that as teachers we have a body of specialized knowledge and we go through a period of training. So what is it to be educated as a teacher? What is it to be trained as a teacher? And where are those key where are we at kind of reconciling those tensions? Um, so uh, we've got some great uh, two keynote speakers. We've got John, Professor John Morgan, who's the head of critical studies here, who's going to, has a very uh, kind of global view of teacher education. And we have um, Jacoba, um, the Associate Pro, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Pacific, Jacoba uh, Makapo, um, who will also be giving a, a keynote speech. Um, we welcome. Um, I believe that teacher education is everybody's kind of role. Um, I see fellow associate teachers here that we work closely with, and that's um, yeah. So so that's the editorial out of the way. Tenth uh, of April there'll be a call for papers for abstracts. The question is, we are um, what is what is the role of initial teacher education in the current um, circumstances we find it. Um, I, I just note in England and the UK, they are being told by the government, this is the, these are the readings that are okay, these are the things you're allowed to teach. Um, where do you see us heading? Thanks, Paul, and it picks up on a question online. Are we getting uh, to see the knock-on in teacher um, training? Initial teacher education are getting teachers driven by literacy and numeracy policy, generating cookie cutter rather than teachers with passion. Yeah, yeah. So you might want to put those two together if someone's got an answer. Well, I think this is the time that um, initial teacher education really needs to be strong. It's um, so important that we don't go into the cookie cutter approach because we know that every single child that comes into our school is different, has different needs, is unique, um, learns differently, has different experiences to bring into, into our schools. And we need people coming into our schools who know that, who understand that, who know about the importance of developing relationships, who know that it's not on the 26th of March, page 10 of the book, and on the 27th of March, page 11, they actually know that we need to know the learner, that they actually know about um, the different needs that there may be with um, challenging behaviours or some of the other needs that we have within our schools. They understand that. They know how to run their reading program or their maths program. They know what that looks like. And I think that's one of the things that um, as a principal, I'd be looking for, for those people who apply for the jobs that are at our school. I'd be wanting to know that there's a passion. They have strengths. They, they're creative. 
that they want to make a difference every single day. And that difference is not prescribed from someone else. It's actually they've been trained and they know that they're, they're going to craft their craft, as I mentioned before, over the years that they have ahead of them. I think one of the things that we do need to be thinking about a lot more is we have our universities and we have our initial teacher training providers and there are many of them and I think that's a real issue for us in this country. But we have those, once our teachers start as provisionally registered teachers, then the initial teacher provider is out of the way. They've gone. This is actually something where we need to be thinking about the learning continuing, the relationships continuing. And I think we haven't really, there's been little moves around that in the past, little pieces of research done, in fact, some quite big pieces of research done around what that could look like. But we need to have that conversation around what initial teacher education is going to look like in this country and how we can actually get the very, very, very best people trained into our into our classrooms. So that's sort of a bit of a long answer, but um, somebody else might like pick up on what I've said. Uh, I just agree with what you've said about the continuation pass, because I do think with a lot now working in um, a university, a lot of our teacher education is a one-year grad course. Mm. So it's really only the start of your journey in learning to be a teacher. Mm. And so we do have to really think about how will we continue uh, supporting teachers across teacher education throughout the teaching journey, rather than thinking the one year is done and dusted and that's where it ends, which is the system that we have at the moment. Yeah, so it's about partnerships. But I also share your concerns about what's happened in the UK. I was fortunate to be in the UK for most of last year and saw firsthand the, the um, turmoil that's been caused in, in teacher education because of the expectation that everybody is teaching the same lesson plans and has to stick to them in teacher education and that you can be... Is, it, is there such a word as unaccredited or discredited? I guess I don't know. Basically for not following the explicit guidelines of what has to be taught. And I think that kind of counters our understanding of teacher education about developing adaptive expertise. Yeah. So if that's how your teacher education is produced, it's, yeah, very detrimental. We're going to, we're, I'm just looking at our time. It's 18.50 and we're going to finish in 10 minutes and let's, let's take the question and ask our panel to be quite brief so that maybe we can get one last one in as well. Kia ora. Thank you, Mr. Brickton. Uh, kia ora, uh, Susan, Principal at Upper Harbour Primary School over on the North Shore. Um, busy principals pick up snippets and sometimes we get things muddled, but I'm curious about where we're heading towards assessment and testing um, with what lies ahead and um, what the panel would like to say about that. Sure. I'll, I'll just start to say um, I'm only hearing whispers as well. I don't think anything's been confirmed, but the whispers I've been hearing is two tests from year three upwards each year. Um, I think that that's uh, completely unrealistic. I don't know any education system which has two kind of nationwide standardised tests each year because that's extremely expensive to administer. And rather, the money would be much better spent on developing and resourcing the teaching profession. Yeah. So I'll just take a really quick example. NACLAN in Australia, 15 years that's been in place. For 15 years, it's shown that the Australian education system is not serving Aboriginal learners or you know First Nation Australian learners because for the past 15 years, it's shown that those are the students who are underachieving regards to NACLAN. Yeah, doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Um, the thing about tests is that they start to replace the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So um, if we are going to test, we need to make sure that we've got a damn good test um, and that it taps the things that we value. So those higher order critical thinking things that, that we are aiming for, these are the things that we would want to know about. Now, whether a test tells us about those things, 
and whether that's the best way to find out about those things, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced. And, and just thinking of Martin Thrupp again, his work is really clear that once you introduce those regimes, the, the fallout is on the rich, broad curriculum, which is also an ideal that progressive educators have. And actually, that's what children deserve. And you lose the arts, you lose the social sciences, though, you know, the evidence is really clear, especially from what happened in, in the UK, that once you start introducing that kind of testing, the impact across everything that's taught and learned in the school um, shifts. We've got one last question, which comes from um, our online uh, group, um, and they've stuck there, um, still sitting at around 100 people um, online. <laughs> I know, it's incredible. They probably had a cups of tea, though, and, and had stretches. You know, and maybe some of them have just kind of left the Zoom on. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I, I know people who do. Um, this is a quick, a quick one, I guess, um, without quick and easy solutions. But what would be the single thing you would want to change or stabilise in our education system that should be bipartisan? That there should be consensus about it's not a political football that we could all agree um, on as people who live here in Aotearoa. The minister. <laughs> <laughs> it's very early. <laughs> this has been a cry for a long time, I think. I, I would want to make sure that our, our profession is held in high regard and treated mm -hmm. as the professionals that we are and resourced to be the professionals that we need to be in order to support our children. You said quite yeah. Yep. And I would have to agree, I started off with that issue around the resourcing and the support that we need for our teachers. Um, there are many aspects to that, obviously. That's exactly what we need. Um, I do say that um, those who are closest to children and who work alongside as researchers are the ones that should be actually setting the direction for education. And politicians actually have a role to play they have a role to play in finding the resourcing that we need to do the job to make the difference for all of the children that we have to work with. Can't really say much better than that, so um, I'll thank you for those words. <laughs> um, I'm going to thank the panel in, in a few minutes. Um, the last question that we got actually ties in, not the, that last one, but the, the real last one, <laughs> which is um, from someone online who said, what are we going to do? And what's the AEC going to do this, this new collective, which, which is now launched with its first public event? We do have a website. We are asking for people to become members of the collective. And it's a very straightforward process. You can do that online. We're asking for content to put up. We're asking for people to feel like they belong to a collective of academics here in the university and school thought leaders. I have a sense that the next few years will be at least interesting as we move into um, or as we move back, aren't we? Not move into, as we move back, as we take our country back. So um, those ideas will be important for us to think about and to respond to uh, with research-informed and research-led ideas. And so please keep an eye out. There will be uh, more events. There will be more engagement in the media from the collective. Um, and it's important to hang tight as a profession, as a community that values the sorts of things that we do. And if they come under threat in the coming months and years, then we need to be prepared um, to stand up for what we believe in, which are those ideals so beautifully crafted by so many others. Um, the ideal that Education is a gift, an intergenerational gift that promises that we don't have to die in the same world 
in which we were born. And I think that promise of that gift has richly informed the work of our panel who have given up like you have this evening to engage in the richness of the debate. So first of all, all my the paki paki. And they're uh, clapping online as well. And we'll make sure that you know when um, the next Aotearoa Educators Collective has an event. We are officially in the world. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Offline yet? Uh, we're about to go offline. Uh,